All right, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. So I am Annie Forrest, and Sendel, if anything goes wrong, I do have my phone here, so make sure you let me know because I don't want to just be talking to myself. Um, so I'm Annie Forrest, and I um, taught middle school math for 12 years, and uh, this year started a role as instructional coach. Um, so the things that I'm going to share with you today are mostly from my uh, classroom experience. Um, so things that I've actually tried in my own classroom teaching sixth graders for the most part. Um, I come from a district, I'm in uh, Berwyn South, um, it's a near Chicago suburb, and uh, we are a one-to-one -one district, just to kind of give you a little background of kind of where I'm coming from. Um, we've had one-to-one -one devices for uh, six years, so either laptops or iPads. Um, so I think that's just kind of important background knowledge to know kind of like where I'm coming from. Um, it, you know, it's definitely been a journey on this uh, technology kind of path. Uh, it's not like, you know, I just woke up one day and I was like, oh, I just love all things tech. Um, and so definitely um, I'm going to be trying to sort of talk to the broad range of um, people's experiences that I know are coming today. So um, some people might be in a situation where you really use very limited technology. Maybe you have access to a computer lab or a car computers, all the way up to people who are fully implementing one-to-one -one devices and have been for a few years. So that is a little bit of the challenge of the webinar is making sure that I am kind of addressing all the different needs. Um, if we were face-to-face, -face, I would definitely be kind of like asking more like uh, what your level is and um, hopefully playing to the crowd a little bit more, but this is just sort of me talking. So uh, feel free to reach out to me after this webinar if there's anything that I shared or you would like me to expand on. Um, you can ask the questions through this uh, webinar to Sendel and then he can kind of pose those at the end. Um, but hopefully this webinar will meet your needs and, and you'll be able to take something away. Okay, so um, I'm going to present several tools. You're not expected to do any of them all tomorrow. Um, the idea is really just to sort of be inspired. And like Sendel said, it's not going to be about the tool, but it's really about the learning that's going on. Um, and I think you'll kind of see that as we go through the presentation. Um, all right, so I'm just going to go ahead and get started here. So the first thing I wanted to share this slide is um, about using Twitter. So I don't know if you are on Twitter. Um, feel free to use this hashtag. I'm in charge of the social media for ICTM, so that's like basically Facebook and Twitter. Um, and we're sort of trying to revive this hashtag that's um, IL Math Chat or Illinois Math Chat. Um, so if you are on Twitter and you wanted to tweet anything today during this webinar, um, go ahead and use that hashtag in my um, Twitter handles there as well. If you are not on Twitter, I cannot um, highly recommend it enough for professional learning. Um, truly, it is a place to connect and learn and discuss with other educators that are sharing things all of the time. So um, just like in the old days when we would borrow and steal from our neighbor down the hall things that we wanted to do in our classrooms, uh, we are borrowing and stealing from each other on Twitter all the time, but not just from your neighbor down the hall, but now from the district next door, from people down the state, from people in other states. Um, and people are doing a lot of that through Twitter. So um, consider using that as a professional tool. Um, especially if you're getting started in this process of using technology in your classroom. It's really a wealth of information. Um, okay, so I'm going to kind of jump into it. Uh, I wanted to start with like the why. Like why is it important that we get at student thinking using, if you want to use technology, but why do we need to get at student thinking? So I'm starting with sort of like a simple problem here, a perimeter problem. And as you look at this problem, I on purpose put just two dimensions, um, 10 centimeters and 4 centimeters. And you can probably imagine some of the misconceptions that you would see, especially you know, if you teach middle school, you know exactly what your students would do with this problem. Uh, some would get it correct, others would not. Um, so if I pose it in multiple choice format, um, and again, so the students could do 10 plus 4 plus 10 plus 4. Or maybe they took the 10 and doubled it, and then took the 4 and doubled it, and added those two sums together, and arrived at the answer of 28. Okay, and so they would put A. But for all the kids that end up putting A, if I don't know, like, I just right now highlighted two strategies that people might use. How do I know which one that they used? More importantly, B and C are options that are kind of like common distractors, right? So if they chose B as an answer, they probably added the two dimensions together but didn't add up all four sides. And if they chose C, they probably are getting confused with area and they multiply the two dimensions together and then D is sort of just out there as another option. Or maybe altogether they just guessed and guessed A as an answer. I mean, you have a one in four chance of getting it right and having no idea how to do this problem. So 
really getting that student thinking is what is going to help us to design lessons that make sure that we are getting at where the problem is or where the misconception is and how to move students thinking forward. One thing that I hear a lot of educators say is, you know the thing about math that I like is it's just black and white. It's right or it's wrong. There's an answer to every problem, and I just like that about math. And honestly, I don't know if it's like I'm getting a little old and crabby or what it is, but that kind of just gets under my skin because honestly, I think math is nothing. It's not black and white. It is anything but black and white. And as I just went through, there are lots of different ways that kids could be making sense of this problem or having a misconception. And I want to know why that is. The kid that answered D because they had no, answer, no way to do this problem is a different kid than the one that put B that knew they were supposed to add but just wasn't, just had that misconception about making sure that they add up all the sides. And so if, is math really just truly black and white or is it really every color in between with all of this thinking going on and all of these rich conversations that we can be having around what kids are actually thinking. Um, and that's important uh, because we really just want to make sure that we are addressing kids where they are at. Um, we can lament the good old days. Oh, back in the day, kids knew their multiplication facts and our life was just so much easier. Our kids these days, they can't do anything with fractions. I mean, is that true? Like, truly cannot do anything with fractions. I mean, that's absolutely not true. I talked to my two-year-old daughter. I break something in half and give it to her. She could tell me if those are two equal pieces, if it's in half or if I broke it in some other way. So if my two-year-old daughter has some understanding of fractions, I mean, our middle school kids or high school kids or whatever, they also have some understanding that they are coming to the table with. Um, and so it's really important to be able to get at that so that we can design lessons that push them to the next level. Um, I want to make sure uh, that I kind of give a little shout out to this resource that I'm going to be referencing a couple of times during this webinar. Um, so this is called Principles to Actions. If you haven't gotten your hands on it, um, it was put out by National Council of Teachers of Mathematics. Um, you can buy the actual print book or there's, there's an e-book that you can download. Um, but it is just really helpful at taking some of the things that we know about math education and giving some practical like action steps to help us get to the place that we want to get to when it comes to teaching about math. Um, so the first um, table I'm going to put up here, it's a little wordy, but I thought it was really important to share because it does talk all about student thinking and that's what we're discussing. So I want to sort of focus on the left hand side of this table, the part that's talking about what are teachers doing? So when we are looking at kids thinking, first of all, we want to decide what counts as evidence. What do we want to elicit from our kids? Um, how are we going to gather that? Then once we have it, how do we interpret it um, and assess to see what's going on? Then how do we do use that to make our in the moment decisions of what's going to happen during that lesson? And then at the end, how do you reflect and plan moving forward going from that point? So today, um, this webinar is going to be about the tools that you can use to help elicit and gather the evidence. Um, I'm going to kind of be focusing on that piece of it. Um, but an important part is deciding what is the evidence that you want to be collecting. We need to be asking good questions and we need to be um, making sure that the evidence we're collecting is purposeful and useful to us too. Um, okay. So, a lot of the tools that I'm sharing today have to do with formative assessment, and that kind of makes sense, right, because we're talking about how do we get at student thinking, and then how do we use that to inform our instruction. So um, I'll just kind of like jump, oh no, I do have a quote. So uh, this is from Principles to Action. So an excellent mathematics program integrates the use of mathematical tools and technology. I love that word integrates because it really makes it seem like it's a part of it. Um, another sort of pet peeve of mine is sort of when people think, well, there's instruction and then there's technology. You know, and I might sit down with a teacher and they're like, okay, I have a technology question. Okay, now take off your technology hat. Now let's talk about the math. And really, I, we, those two things should be so integrated that it's not like we're taking off our technology hat and putting on our math hat, but really how can they kind of seamlessly go together to just make your classroom a place where you are eliciting student thinking and having conversations about math. Um, and also the other thing I like about this quote is talking about it, technology being an essential resource. We are at the point where technology is an essential resource. We are no longer at the point where we can just pretend like it's not there or do things the way we've always done it. 
Um, we really need to, I mean, you're doing a disservice to kids if you're not using technology to help them move their thinking forward. Um, okay, so I thought I would start with, I, I do have some tools to share, and I think that's really important. And the tools I want to share are very rich tools that I think you could use tomorrow in your classroom. But before I get to the which tools, I wanted to share my process for thinking through or vetting the tools um, as they come across my desk. Because I'm always, like I said, on Twitter, finding out about new things. And how do I decide which ones are good to try and which ones aren't? Um, first, I will say, though, also, it's, it's important to be a little bit of a risk taker in this new world of technology and try things. And don't be afraid to be like, you know, we tried that yesterday, guys, and that wasn't a tool for us. We, you know, we're going to put that one to the side. Um, so I think there's a little piece of that. But there are some markers, I think, of good technology to use in your classroom. And so I came up with six. Um, and these are things that I, these are lenses that I sort of look at tools through to decide if I think that they are going to be helpful um, when I was in my own classroom or now that I'm working with teachers to help them sort of decide, you know, is this a tool I want to use? So on your screen you see the first three and then I have a slide that has the next three. So the first is, does this tool allow me to hear and see thinking in the moment? Um, there are tools out there, you know, like that kids can basically turn in a worksheet to their teacher and their teacher can go home and grade the worksheet kind of like in a traditional way. Um, and that's, you know, enhancing, I guess, a little bit of the workflow. But the real power, I think, in um, using technology in your classroom is the in the moments because that is when the misconceptions happening that is when the thinking is happening and that is what you want to be um, I don't know able to address right away so if I can have a tool that lets me hear or see thinking in the moment I think that can be really powerful the next thing and this might be a little controversial um, but I'm gonna say I really look for tools that have no time limit and I'm sure that some people might want to email me later and tell me about this great game that they have, that their kids love playing in math class. And I, I do think it has a place to play some of those type of timed games in math class. So um, you don't have to throw them all out. But I will challenge us to think about if there's a game that has a time limit, ticking down, it's like fact practice, let's say, and it has some type of a game aspect where there's a timer, the kids that are, there are kids that enjoy that, but the kids that are not enjoying that, why is that, right? And we are charged with teaching the kids that are in front of us right now, not the kids we wish we had, not the kids we had 10 years ago, but the kids we have right now. And we need to make sure that we are not just um, kind of playing to the crowd of the group of kids that like math and feel comfortable in math and have no math anxiety. We need to make sure everybody's feeling comfortable. And I don't think anything says math anxiety more than having to do a timed fact practice. Um, so that is why I say no time limit. But again, not that you can never do a fun game or something like that that has a time limit. But for me, all the tools I'm going to be sharing today have no time limit. Um, okay, the third thing is um, I like to pick tools that are not specific to one standard or topic. Nobody has time for every single unit. You have to go research and find a new tool. Now we're doing division, I need this app. Now that we're doing subtraction, I need this one. Now that we're doing area, I need a new tool. Um, everything that I'm sharing today are things that you can use systematically in your classroom throughout the year um, because it's not about a specific standard or topic. It's about how to elicit uh, student thinking and how to gather that information. Uh, the next three set of criteria I've chosen, um, the first is, um, and again, the tools I'm sharing today, not all of them will hit all six of these criteria, like my dream tool would. Um, but so I really do like, though, if you have a variety of media can be added. In other words, like you're able to type, you could record, the teacher could record um, to maybe help your um, emergent bilingual students, you know, if they have... Uh, they need things read it or read to them. Um, I also really like if the tool will give you the capability to draw in some way because we all know that it can be kind of a pain or kind of cumbersome to type math sometimes, especially like fractions or math symbols or whatever. So, or if we want to visually represent something like using an area model for um, distributive property or something like that, you want you want the kids to be able to draw. Uh, so I like a variety of media. Um, I really think it's important to be the ability to give feedback within the tool is really helpful. Timely feedback, 
getting at those misconceptions, that is what can really um, impact learning as well. And then the last piece is tough to find, um, and not every tool is going to have it, but if there's some way to connect with a wider audience, I think that can be really powerful as well. So somehow to connect outside of the four walls of your school or outside the four walls of your classroom, maybe with other classes, or even just to give kids in that classroom a chance to connect with each other, I think that can be helpful. So I'm going to come back to these kind of six criteria. Um, criteria I didn't mention that I still think is important, but like usability, just like is it easy to use as a teacher um, and easy to set up, easy for kids to use. Um, those are kind of givens to me, but, but those I could have included those as well because those are pretty important. All right, so now I'm going to sort of get in the actual tools. Um, but again, I want to stress that if you're kind of using those criteria that I talked about, it really is not about the tool. It really is about um, finding things that are going to work in your classroom that are going to get at kids thinking. But I wanted to share some tools because it's good to have some resources to, to kind of go away with today and, and get started. So the first one is called ClassKick. Um, ClassKick is nice because it gives you the ability to um, and on this kind of screenshot that's on your screen, you'll see at the top are the, the different slides. And on each slide, you would put a different problem. Um, and then from the teacher dashboard, beneath the, the slides at the top, there's each student's work. And you actually see in real time kids working and doing the problems that, um, that they're, like, so whatever slide they're on, you actually see their work. And then you can click on an individual student, and then you can actually write or type or uh, give feedback right away to that student as they are working. Um, and you scroll, like on the screen, you only see four, but if you scroll down, you would like see your whole class um, as they're working. Uh, so I like this tool. What I would do with it is um, typically, um, you want to be a little strategic about it. it you don't want to pick something that kids are going to need a ton of assistance from you because you're not. The, the goal is to have kids kind of working and you sort of monitoring and looking for trends. And what I would do is I would set up an assignment that might be slides 1 through 15, let's say. And maybe 1 through 10 are content level or um, grade level content that I want the kids to get to. And maybe the last five slides are the extension. So it's kind of naturally ramped up. You start kind of easy so you can have that low floor and go up to a high ceiling. Um, with the goal of not every kid finishing all the way through the end of the assignment, but maybe getting to like slide 10. As kids are working, I would be sort of scrolling through and looking for trends. So let's say on slide 2, I see these five kids are all having the same issue. I could quickly call them to maybe my round table, have a discussion with them, quick fix that misconception, send them back, and then I'm back to looking at my teacher dashboard looking for more misconceptions. As I'm doing this, I might be on my device walking around because we all know you still need to be interacting with kids. They might have questions for you. There's just kind of the management piece. It's important as a teacher to be walking around. You don't just sit at your desk and stare at a screen. You have kids in front of you even though you're using a tech tool. But this just makes the management of it so easy. It makes looking for those trends so easy. Um, and so that's what I really like about class. Plus, it, um, going back to my slides about what I look for, it lets me hear and see uh, in the moment, no time limit. It's not specific to a standard or topic. It's very easy to, um, you actually could just even take a picture of like a worksheet or something like that, and you can just crop and take um, different questions for each slide very quick and easy. It's super fast to set up an assignment in ClassKit. Um, a variety of media can be added. You can record your voice. You could give it like a little hint or uh, put in web links. Um, and there's ability to give feedback. And as far as connecting with a wider audience, you're not necessarily having the kids share out to the whole wide audience. But there is a way to enable kids to help each other within the app. Or actually, you know, I forgot to say. Um, this is, all the tools I'm sharing today are not device specific. And I thought that was important too because we're all coming with different devices. So whether you're using a laptop, iPad, Chromebook, or whatever your device might be, all of these tools are going to work on all of those devices. Um, so if I slip up and say app, it's just because our district is um, using all iPads at this moment. Um, but all of these tools are available um, web-based as well. Okay, so anyway, you can um, have the kids uh, interact with each other within ClassKick as well, so that's kind of the connection piece. You can also turn it off um, 
and as we all know, especially if you teach middle school, right, like what happens when you let just kids have free reign over each other's slides, you can imagine, it does take some scaffolding to get kids to the point where you would want them to be interacting in that way. Um, so you don't want to do it right away, but it's definitely a point to work towards. Um, okay, so Senda wants to pop in with a few questions, so of course. So yeah, we've, we're getting some great questions from folks who yeah. are on uh, the webinar. Um, and I think you answered one of them, um, okay. which was which platform or which device uh, Classic works on, uh, works yes, both thank on a tablet I meant to and on laptops. Yeah. Sure. And then related to that, someone else was asking uh, what you'd recommend to see students text or drawings if students have laptops instead of a, a tablet device where they'd be entering directly on, on the screen. Oh, I mean, because it's a little challenging to use a, like a trackpad to draw. Is that uh, I guess, yeah. Okay, yeah, that's okay. I I don't have a great recommendation for that. Um, you know, there's always the option of having kids do something like on a whiteboard or paper, and you could like take a picture of it and submit that way. Um, so that would be my workaround for that. I have used that quite a few times because um, I had laptops for a while before we got to iPads. So that might be my workaround. Otherwise, I mean, to be honest with you, kids get pretty good at using whatever device they have, and they will find a way. So um, sorry, that's not kind of a non-answer, but I would maybe go the whiteboard way, taking a picture of it and uploading it that way would be my best. Got it. And um, someone else wanted to point out that uh, she has found that Classic works really well um, in her role um, working with special education teachers to help diagnose not just exactly what kids are thinking, but also who needs more support and what interventions may be helpful for them. Yeah. And, you know, you the structure that I mentioned a second ago where I said like, okay, I really like that I can um, in real time be kind of looking for trends and pulling that group. Well, sometimes that group is going to be your high kid and a low kid, just they happen to have the same misconception at that moment. So it's not like I have to pre-assign these groups. It's in real time I'm making groups that make sense based on the thinking that I've seen going on. So, um, all right. I hope that's going back to the view that you are seeing. Um, okay, so the next tool that I wanted to share um, is called Recap. Uh, this tool um, is really nice because it is a little, the, the kids record a short video response. Um, the teacher poses a question and it's just one question. So I have used this more for like an exit slip or you could use it as, as a station maybe. Um, but you basically just pose one question and then you, um, the kids record their answer to it. Um, the nice thing about it is if you can set a, um, a cap on the amount of time that the kids get to record a video. Because, you know, when I had 100 students that I was teaching in sixth grade, I didn't want two-minute videos from each kid. I don't have 200 minutes to sit down and watch all these videos. So I would set it at like 15 seconds. And really, it really helps, too, kids to get uh, better and more concise and more um, sharp in their understanding and their explanation. Um, so I might say, like, oh, tell me how you find the surface area of a rectangular prism. And, um, and kids could record their answer to that. Um, and then you would review them. And um, there is a way it, within the app you can actually email the little video to a parent or to somebody, a stakeholder at home, that would want to see a video. So it's kind of a nice way of sharing out. Um, I've seen people use it at parent-teacher conferences. You sort of have all this like little library of videos that you can sort of pull up and show to parents um, when they come in to, to discuss their child with you. Um, you can share them out to the class. And the only thing I would say about that is, you know, you just want to be cautious as you're trying to build a community of learners in your classroom to be really respectful of kids. Um, putting yourself on a video is really kind of putting yourself out there. And so if you do plan to share the videos with a class, I would make sure you tell them that up front. Nobody wants to be surprised by, you know, talking, um, you know, let's say they did it at home for a homework assignment. They're sitting there in their pajamas talking to you and you sort to class the next day. So let's just be respectful of our learners and make sure our communities feel really safe for them to share. Um, but going back to my criteria for recap, um, I don't know if you can hear and see and think, or you can hear and see they're thinking in the moment, but it's pretty much in the, I mean, as soon as they record it, you get to see it from your dashboard. Um, and there's no time limit for it. Um, it's not specific to one standard. 
Um, a variety of media can be added. That one does not work for this. Um, there is ability to give feedback, and you can connect with a wider audience by sharing um, out. Uh, Sendel just texted me a question that are all these tools free? Yes, that was another thing I had on my notes here that I forgot to say to you. All of these tools are free. So that is another um, criteria that I wanted to share that I was making sure that um, all these are accessible to you no matter um, you know what district that you're working in. Okay. Um, the third one that I wanted to share is called Formative. Um, so Formative is a tool that's it's kind of similar to ClassKick in the way that you might use it. Uh, it would be for um, having kids working on maybe some practice problems in class or whatever. Um, the nice thing about Formative, uh, the, the teacher dashboard just looks a little slicker. It's a little easier to navigate. Um, there also are different options of types of questions, whereas um, ClassKick is just a little more just like, uh, blank slides and you can add the content to it. Formative gives you choices so you could say like, oh, I want this to be a multiple choice question. I want this one to be a write-in question. I want this one to be whatever. Um, so that's kind of nice. You definitely wouldn't want to make the whole thing multiple choice because that's, again, going against what we're just talking about, about making student thinking visible. But a couple checks within, you know, a couple um, show your thinking questions and a quick check that is uh, multiple choice can be kind of helpful and then with informative it will um, you put in what the right answer is and then you can see on your screen all the kids that got it right all the kids that you know got it wrong or whatever so it is kind of nice to easily grade and then you also can um, give comments back to them um, so if I go against my criteria again um, I can hear and see thinking in the moment this tool again in real time, you see what the students are doing, and you can give them feedback. Um, there is no time limit to this. It's not specific to a standard or a topic. Um, a variety of media can be added. Um, the ability to give feedback to this one, uh, you can give feedback using formative, but if you want to be able to give feedback in ClassKick, you can actually write on the kid's slide, and that is kind of a nice tool, I think, especially in math, because you can circle things. You can say, look at this, or hint, or you know, make sure you're doing this. Um, it's a little trickier to do that in formative, so um, that would be one drawback and, and a bonus for ClassKick. Um, and then there's not really a way to connect with a wider audience with, with formative. But again, these are all just tools to have in your tool belt. It's not like you have to pick one and be like, oh, I'm team class kick or I'm team formative. Um, depending on what it is that you are doing in that class that day or whatever, there might be a tool that fits better depending on your needs. So that's why I kind of wanted to share all of them. Um, the nice thing about all of these tools, all three of these tools that I shared have amazing tutorial videos on their websites. So if you go to um, any of them and you want to get started tomorrow, you can easily, you can sh watch basically like a little five minute video that will walk you through the process of setting up a class and you can be ready to go for tomorrow. Um, so again, I might, if it was me and I was watching this and all these were new to me, I would pick the one that kind of spoke to you the most and kind of go with that. You know, and just try one tomorrow. And um, like I said, it's just a little bit of setting up your class ahead of time, setting up the tool, but then once you have it, it's pretty much done for the rest of the year, and then you just have a system in place that you can use whenever it is that you want to elicit student thinking. Um, and then the last, uh, I don't know, it's not just one tool, but just kind of a group of tools that I just want to kind of throw out there as an option is just using social media. Um, so if your students have access to, you know, um, devices, think about could they do a blog, could they have a math blog, or could they connect with Twitter? You know, if they're 13 or older, um, could they use Twitter to tweet out their reflections? Or um, if you're interested in this idea, like I even uh, blogged about it a little bit on um, on my blog that kind of explains how you can sort of set up a Google form to look like Twitter um, so that younger students can do something similar. So, you know, you can really rethink your exit slips or your homework using social media, and I think it's just, um, you know, it's just a new way of thinking about how you can get um, at student thinking. So I wanted to throw that out there as an option as well. Um, I wanted to just touch on briefly the idea of, you know, what what is our goal with technology. Um, it's not just using tech for tech's sake. That is absolute, and I hope that, you know, just even in this brief part of this webinar that you've gotten 
that idea from me that I am not just saying like, I think all technology is great and we just need to use more tech just because. Um, so there's really purposeful ways. And so substitution, this, this bottom layer of um, the slide kind of talks about substitution. So that would be just basically using your device as a worksheet. So instead of doing it on paper, we're just doing it on the device. And then augmentation would be, um, well, the, the technology somehow is helping in, in just augment the the benefit a little bit. And then really the magic is coming when you can use technology that to modify or redefine what it is that you you couldn't have even done before without the technology. You know, when you are pulling groups in real time based on the trends that you're seeing going on in your classroom using your technology, I mean, that is really modifying the way that you are running your classroom. Um, the last thing I just want to kind of pose out there, and I don't know how I'm doing on time here, but um, is really letting kids be creative in math class. Um, we can really start to rethink what students can produce to show understanding. Um, this is from, this slide is from the um, Principles to Action again. Um, and so they kind of in that document go through what are some unproductive beliefs. So it's not a great belief if you think that you only can use multiple choice or ob objective paper and pencil tests to measure mathematical knowledge reliably and accurately. There are other ways that you can get at understanding. And so I just wanted to share a, an idea. Um, one, and this is not like the only thing you can do, but one thing I did last year was I was, we were talking about fractions in sixth grade. It's a, it's a big topic that comes around again and again in sixth grade. And I wanted to get that good, good students really make sense of what is a twelfth and how do you, how do you represent twelfths and and this is a number on the number line and fractions are numbers and I was kind of trying to get at all that really important stuff and so I had the kids actually make stop action videos to show a um, fraction strip folding into twelve so I'm just going to kind of play this for you so you can see and as I was watching the videos that my students made I really was able to see you know some kids did the student did to six first, and then she took the six and folded it up again, and then folded that in half again. And so really it was kind of getting at, you know, some multiplication ideas and some other things. Some kids did thirds, and then doubled that, and then you know, whatever. So people had different ways, and I really saw a lot of thinking just in having them do this little stop action video project. And it was just a different way of assessing. I could have given a paper and pencil test, I could have made it multiple choice, I could have whatever. But really um, finding new ways to assess student thinking um, by having kids create something, I think can be a really powerful way to use technology as well. Um, so, you know, mathematical, this is again from uh, principles actions, but mathematical understanding and processes can be measured through the use of a variety of assessment strategies and tasks. So again, we are not just limited to um, certain things. And you know, if your district is really uh, big on data and you know, like our district uses map testing or whatever, that is a piece of the puzzle, but it's not the only piece. And so you really want to think about, okay, how can I use that data? How can I use my classroom observations? How can I use some other assessments to really kind of put together a whole picture of what my students are understanding and what they think and what are they able to do and, and learn in math. Oh. So I don't know how I am on time. Um, I don't know what time I should be going to, but um, before I take uh, maybe more questions, um, I did have a, just a couple of little like, I don't know, commercials, I guess, to uh, share with you. The first is um, that, uh, you know, I'm in charge of the social media for ICTM, and one of the things that we are doing is really trying to connect more educators throughout the state. Um, and so these are all some um, teachers that maintain um, math ed blogs and um, if you want to follow um, ICTM on Facebook we are highlighting one blogger a week and sharing one blog post a day um, for that blogger um, and these are all their Twitter handles if you're on Twitter you could follow them um, so it's just one way I really just want to be able to connect people um, outside of our conference which is amazing but you know there's 364 other days of the year that I really want to be connecting people as well so this is one of the ways um, the other thing um, that I wanted to uh, encourage you to do is our district does a um, 
a technology conference for students. And so actually, uh, registration goes through the end of this week. So if you have any students in grades 3 through 12, which is probably most of the people um, involved in this webinar, um, consider inviting your students to participate in this. Any district is welcome to attend. It is in Berwyn, but um, uh, it's a really great day of learning for the kids. Um, they can either present or just attend and um, you know, just learn more about technology and what they can be doing with their devices. And the last um, opportunity is another professional development opportunity for teachers that I wanted to share with you. Um, my district puts on a um, technology conference for teachers. Um, and the first day, you can come to one day, both days, um, depending on your needs. The first day is a um, chance to see some one-to-one -one classrooms in action. So it's a Friday, you get to come and visit some classrooms. And then uh, on Saturday is more of a traditional conference with sessions um, and led by presenters that are using um, different you know, best practices in their classroom. So I wanted to invite everybody to um, come to that as well. So that is it for my kind of formal presentation, but I'm also happy to answer any questions. So I don't know if um, Sindel, if you have anything else that you have seen come through that you want me to address? Oh, yes. We have lots and lots of questions. Oh, good. Um, probably more than we could fit in today. But okay. uh, thank, thank you, you. For, to everyone for, for your engagement and for your questions. Um, and uh, one of the questions that has come up a couple times is how using these tools has affected how kids are engaged in mathematics in your classes. Uh, kind of along with that is a feeling like I'm, I'm sure kids learn a lot about technology but what about the math? Right. Um, so could you address those two together, maybe? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, sometimes there's a little bit of a trap, especially, um, I don't know, it kind of goes back to that idea, too, about, like, oh, you know, math is just so black and white or whatever. Math is, tends to be boring, so we need to spice it up. So technology is the way to kind of spice it up. And I think if you are ask, asking your students to do boring math on technology, it's just as boring as if you're asking them to do boring math on paper. So taking a boring worksheet and putting it on technology does not make it that any more engaging and will not give you any more success or any more student learning going on than um, using it on paper. So I think there's sometimes a trap of people saying, I, I, want, to, I want to use technology because I want my kids to be engaged. You need to make um, the content really engaging and exciting for kids no matter what. The technology is not going to be the magic bullet that will do that for you. Um, so there's that. And then I think the other piece is people are sometimes kind of worried about, like, are they engaged enough that they won't be, like, on the Internet or being whatever. And so that's kind of going back to what I was saying about, you know, there's still the classroom management piece. So you can't just be at your desk on your computer watching the, the you know, answers come in and expect that there's not going to be any issues. Um, you still need to be walking around. You still need to be talking with kids. You still need to be answering their questions. Um, all those things that you know make good teaching still need to be in place even when you have technology. So, I don't know. Is that a non-answer? But No, no, I think that's helpful. Um, I, I think the, another set of questions is kind of related. Uh, one person said, this is all really new to me. This sounds exciting, but how do I get started? And another said, what was the hardest thing about starting to use these tools? Um, so what would you suggest? I know it's been uh, a multi-year journey for you and your district, but, but what was right. it like to get started? Right, and so like when I was planning this webinar, that was part of my concern, right? I wanted to share enough that people would be like, oh, this was helpful. She shared a lot of ideas. But then if I share too much, then it's like, wow, this is kind of overwhelming. Where am I supposed to start? So I think truly you kind of reflect back on, you know, these tools that I shared or whatever, and you sort of just pick one. And you say, what am I going to start tomorrow? And you try that one tool. And, you know, then after you try it, you sort of reflect. What did you like about it? What did you not like? What would be the man what management do you need to have in place to make it go better? Or, you know, is it just not going to work for you? Scrap it, can we try something else? Um, but I don't know. I think I would just start with one and kind of get good at that and sort of get that into the culture of your classroom and have a routine that what this is how we use class kick or whatever. And then, you know, when you start to get a little bored with it or you need something new or whatever, you're ready, then you try the next one. Um, also don't be afraid to try something and have it not go great. You know, you don't need to be, I think classroom culture is changing a little bit to um, the model where the, the teacher needs to be the be-all, end-all, know-it-all of everything. Um, you know, students come in with a 
lot of knowledge too. And I'm not afraid to say to kids, like, hey, did you use this in social study? Can you come and show me how to, you know, do this? And they are more than happy to help. And I was more than happy to have them help me. So just really um, be willing to be a little vulnerable to your students and model that you are growing and you have that growth mindset and you are out there trying new things too it goes a long way um, to kids respecting you. They don't, they don't need you to be the absolute expert on every single technology tool, but they do need you to um, be trying new things, just like you're expecting them to try new things. I think that's great advice. Um, related to that, um, someone was wondering about your or your district's expectations with technology for new teachers. Or do you expect new teachers to have any specific technology skills? You know, I think um, when I'm in interviews uh, for new teachers, you know, the interview questions I'm noticing are, have really started to change. You know, it's not so much about what do you know about technology. I'm more asking, where do you go when you want to learn something new? So I'm not expecting, like, we're not expecting new teachers to come in with the knowledge, but we, we really are wanting to get teachers that know um, how to use their professional learning or know how to uh, reach out to others, want to learn, um, have that desire to um, really be the best they can be. So I don't think that you um, are expected to use every tech tool, but you're expected to um, really have the mindset that you want to um, you know, learn new things and um, use best practice. Um, and so I think that I think that's more important than having the knowledge of the tech tools because those come and go, you know, and there's all, I mean, new ones tomorrow, like this webinar is going to be obsolete in a year because these tools, there'll be new ones that I'll be like, kind of like, oh, I wish I could do another, and maybe I will, but, you know, like, so it's not about the tool, it's, it's really about, like, the mindset. Great. Um, one other question that someone asked is, these tools are, they, they have power. Right? They give you uh, affordances that, that are interesting and we couldn't do it without the technology. How do you keep the math concrete uh, even as you start using these tools? Can you say more about that? I'm not sure. Right. Mm -hmm. that, that is the question. Um, oh. Just to think about where students are developmentally, how do you keep the math concrete? Um, well, I don't know. They keep it concrete like procedures, do you think they're? Um, uh, I think the, the things that uh, we would have done in our classroom in the absence of technology might have involved them using paper or using manipulatives or building things with their hands. And how does technology interact with that? Right. Sorry, I'm not doing a good job of making the question. No, clear. that's okay. I, yeah, I just want to make sure I'm not answering the, the question they're asking. Um, you know, the, there's... In my classroom, I would have technology, I had interactive notebooks, I had manipulatives that were, you know, I don't know, little tiles, and I had online manipulatives. You, you want to use the tool that's best. So, listen, I'm not advocating for all tech all the time, but I'm also not giving um, permission to say, see, like, we shouldn't use tech, paper and pencil is better. Like, I'm not saying either is better. I think, depending on the situation, different things just work better. I mean, Online geo boards are so awesome because you don't have to buy rubber bands or have them flinging across the room. So, like, use that tool. But if your students really learn well with using little centimeter cubes for an activity, pull out the centimeter cubes. Um, I think it's really about that idea of, like, the um, quote I said about integrating it so they really seem seamless and it doesn't seem like, okay, now ends the technology portion of my lesson and let me get back to the real math. I mean, it really should just be like a sort of a seamless process where you're using both things, um, I don't know, together. So, yeah. What was your word of the year on your blog? Um, what was my, oh, my one word? Uh, purposeful, yes. They, I was like, oh, my one word. Yeah, my one word this year is purposeful. So if you are familiar with one word, one word is like a, instead of a New Year's resolution, you pick one word that sort of frames your thinking for the year. And so my one word is purposeful. And so it really is about like using technology with purpose, um, making sure that the questions I'm asking have purpose, making sure that the work I'm doing has purpose. So um, yeah, purposeful technology is important. Um, 
we're going to go for a few more minutes. I know some folks may have to go, and that's fine. But um, you should have seen uh, Annie's uh, Twitter handle, and we will follow up by sending an email um, so you get the resources from this webinar. But there were some more interesting questions, uh, so I wanted to ask them while we're all here together. Um, one question that has come up is, what if we don't have access to devices every day? And people have described, uh, we have carts. Um, we have a library that we go to. Um, we don't get to use the, the devices that we have every day. Maybe sometimes we use one kind of device and sometimes we use another. Do you have any advice about those kinds of situations and, and how that works? Uh, how, how what you're describing works in those situations? Right. Well, I'll be honest. I mean, I kind of guess or I can kind of give some you know, my best ideas, but luck, I mean, I'm in a lucky position that I've been in a district that has been once one for six years. So I, you know, it was kind of like a long time ago that I was in a position where I didn't have access to devices for, for students. Um, however, um, just because you don't have it every day in your classroom doesn't mean that you can't make use of it. Um, if, if it's a sign out thing, I would sign it out as many times, you know, like just Fill your name, like however many times you're allowed to sign it out, I would sign it out and then I would plan on using them in those days. Um, you know, doing something like ClassKick I think is a good one to start with because it's so quick to make an assignment in it. So even if you were like, oh, you thought you were going to have devices, but then you didn't and then something else happened or whatever, it's really easy to make a quick assignment in ClassKick so that you can use um, the technology that day. Um, Recap, I think, is a good tool that you can use um, no matter, like, you could sort of assign it as a homework assignment and kids could do it, like, on their phone even or something. Um, you know, it's kind of making use of the technology that we know students have. Now, not every kid has a phone, but a lot of families do have a smartphone um, that they could use something like that. So, kind of uh, getting a little creative with it, I guess, um, and, and finding ways to work it in, but that definitely is a challenge, and I would love to hear if there are any teachers that are out there with that situation, uh, I would love to hear how they're using it or even visit and, and, and kind of help them problem solve around that because I think um, it's not a unique chat. I mean, there's lots of districts that are in that position, um, so. Yeah. Great, and um, one other question that came up was around uh, how using the tools affects the instructional time that you have. Does it take more time for kids to learn the technology and then there's less time for the math? Or do they go together somehow? How does that work? Yeah. You know, so the tools that I, uh, if you put something in place, it's going to be a little bit of teaching up front how you want kids to use the tools. So like, let's say you decide to use formative. I mean, there's a little bit of It'll take a little bit of time. But once it's a structure in place, I mean, you're going to use it throughout the whole year. So that time investment, I think, is well spent because then the kids just know how to use it for the rest of the year. Um, if you're doing something more creation, like the kind of stop action video that I shared, that's going to be a little bit more of the, you know, that does take a little bit of time. Um, so, you know, you kind of have to balance it. Um, I think it's still beneficial, though, to spend that time because, I mean, I don't know, do, for example, like if you do a multiple choice test, do we do multiple choice tests because we think it's the best way to get at student thinking? We use multiple choice because it's fast and it's easy to grade, but it's not that it's the best way to get at student thinking. So that, it's like the tool was decided not because it helped us in getting at student thinking, but because it helped us to grade fast and um, maybe give a test to a, a larger group um, quickly. So, you know, you, I don't know, that, I guess that's my, it's not like the multiple choice tests are better, it's just that they are easier to give. So if some of these other ones are getting that student thinking, I think there's a benefit there, but you do need to weigh out, like, okay, just take a little bit of time. You know, how much time can I invest, though, because of the thinking that I'm going to get is so rich, and the learning that's going to happen. You know, it's like the kids are learning while they're doing this formative assessment. So that's really, really powerful, too. You know, it's not like I'm just giving this test just to see where they're at. They're learning while they're doing it. I'm giving them feedback in real time. Like, how amazing is that? So I think the benefits sometimes outweigh the fact that it's taking up a little bit of time. Great. On that note, um, I'm going to just make a few final announcements because we're getting close to uh, 4.30. Thanks so much to Annie for sharing her 
wisdom and expertise. Um, just wanted to mention uh, that uh, we appreciate you being with us today um, and to let you know that uh, these webinars are possible Oops. Uh, thanks to uh, the members of ICTM. So if you are an Illinois mathematics educator, please do join to support efforts like these and our annual conference that Annie mentioned and a variety of other things. Um, you can join at the URL that is uh, on the screen and which I am putting in the chat window. Um, if you're not from Illinois, we welcome you and thank you for joining us. Uh, whether you're a member or not, we appreciate you being here and uh, making an investment in refining your own professional capacity for the benefit of your students. And we encourage you to share uh, everything that we do with your colleagues. Uh, when you leave this webinar, you should get a short survey. It's really, really short. Um, if you could take uh, whatever, five or six minutes to complete that, it would be really, really handy because it helps us um, know how we're doing and to improve our offerings. And a couple other announcements. Um, some of you joined us for our last annual conference in October in Peoria. Next year, we're not having an annual conference, but uh, NCTM is having its regional conference in Chicago. Uh, and so that'll be sort of in its place. Uh, we would love to have you all. You can learn more at the URL that is on your screen again. Um, and if you'd like to know even more than that, um, you can ask me because I'm involved with that. Uh, and finally, uh, we will see you again soon. Uh, we will be having another webinar next month. The presenter and date are uh, in, being figured out, so we'll let you know about that. And we are trying to keep having these every month. Um, so there are two ways you can help. One is by uh, joining and sharing and helping us get the word out. The other way is if you have a topic you'd like to present on, or maybe even just a topic you'd like to hear about, or you know someone who would be a good presenter, we'd love to know um, your advice on that. And you can email me. Um, that's my email address on the screen and in the chat. Um, and it would be really helpful if you let us know. So uh, thank you. Thank you for everyone who is here and for everyone who asked questions and uh, everything else. Um, we'll be sending out a follow-up email soon if you have a colleague who wanted to be here and couldn't or just uh, you heard good things here and you wanted to pass this along to them, you'll be able to do that. Uh, thanks so much, and uh, we will see you next month. Thanks, Annie. Thank you.